Okay, it's uh, it's good to be with you here on a Tuesday. And our first question is, um, how do you know if you have a good coach? Sounds like an easy question. Um, most people choose coaches uh, the way they choose churches, uh, the way they choose friends, um, the way they choose car dealerships. Uh, it's you know it's like who they like well unfortunately when we choose somebody that we just like in every way what we're usually saying is is that it's somebody who already fits into our system of our present comfortable system of getting and protecting behaviors so it's what we're used to well if you're looking to change your life you really don't want somebody who already fits into everything you know because then what are they going to do? They're going to make you just like you already were. So what good is that? So if you want to change, change necessarily involves moments of discomfort. Change involves embracing principles, thoughts, feelings, attitudes um, that you're not familiar with that's always uncomfortable so if you're looking for somebody that it's going to be easy with you can do that but not likely that they're going to help you a coach a good coach simultaneously <coughs> loves you accepts you uh, isn't irritated by you or disappointed by you uh, shows a relative absence of getting and protecting behaviors although if you're looking for a perfect absence of getting and protecting behaviors, uh, there aren't very many people who are going to be that good. So you're looking for somebody who's relatively free of that. Then somebody who will, in addition to accepting you, genuinely cares about you, loves you, which doesn't mean that they'll say everything you want to hear. Um, gosh, you already know how to live the way you live. Uh, they're going to simultaneously love and teach you. So teaching is going to involve, you know, teaching you stuff you don't know, teaching you stuff you don't like. Uh, if you just naturally liked everything that they said, mm, the chances are you'd already be doing it, at least high. So occasionally a coach is going to actually push you, actually more than occasionally, uh, to the place of discomfort where you don't especially like to hear what you're hearing. And then that will change your perspective on things. You will find that you'll be uncomfortable as you hear the truth about yourself. Uh, you will find also that a, a good coach, you'll be able to see the effects of a good coach in that you'll be able to carry what you learn from there and go out and apply it. Now, some of that involves your choices, but a good coach will teach you in ways that will make it easier to go out and see what you're doing in the real world. Uh, and then it's up to you whether you exercise the faith to actually do what you're taught. So the bottom line is a good coach loves and teaches simultaneously, which you'll notice is remarkably similar to the job of a parent. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. Uh, advisor, teacher, parent, mm, they're all you know, pretty identical, just that a parent does, tends to do it with a child, although you could say that we all parent each other when we love and teach each other. So those are the things I would suggest that you look for as you're looking for a coach. Here's a, a viewer who says, I absolutely love the uh, Real Love and Marriage book. I read it almost daily. My question is, my husband just returned from a vacation where he went out west riding motorcycles with his friend. I'm happy that he got to enjoy one of his passions without having to uh, join him myself as I'm very afraid of motorcycles. <coughs> Prior to his leaving, uh, he had to work many hours so that he could get ready, um, so he could get enough done so that he could go on the trip. Um, so we saw very little of him. While he was away, he did call to check in each day. Once he returned, I found it hard to talk about his vacation. Uh, he told us that he rode on very dangerous roads and even in snow. Uh, I feel I should have been more interested in listening and paying attention to him, but now I realize that 
I didn't really show much interest at all. I feel bad for not listening or asking questions about his trip, but I also realize I'm not really interested in what he did. And with the details uh, that he did give me, I couldn't stand to hear any more details. So what can I do? First thing I would con suggest that you think about, at least, is, uh, you know, he went on a vacation, which, you know, probably lasted a, doesn't say how long, but my guess is if he went a long distance and rode motorcycles, probably at least a week. And so for a week, he chose to do something without you. Uh, there's kind of a natural tendency uh, when one partner chooses to engage in an activity without the other, for the other partner to feel resentful at being left out. Maybe you don't. Uh, like you said, you're glad that he was able to do something, especially this without you, because you don't like riding motorcycles. Uh, but you might mm, consider honestly examining yourself and asking whether you resent him doing something without you. And particularly in this activity, if it's motorcycles, and if, it, and if he's going to do that on a regular basis, <coughs> you might consider whether that's something that you're willing to learn to do. Uh, I know a lady who... Uh, hated mo riding motorcycles. Turns out it was the same activity and her husband went on motorcycle rides all the time. And so one day she said, you know, either he's going to be going and doing this all the time without me uh, or I've got to see if I can adapt, change uh, my perspective. And so she asked him to uh, just adapt her to it. So rather than taking her on a week-long motorcycle ride through Twisting Mountain roads, which would be probably not the best way to you know, get used to motorcycle riding. Uh, I don't like riding on the back of a motorcycle because uh, I feel out of control, although I love riding motorcycles. Uh, you might suggest to your husband, as this lady did, uh, so would you be willing to take me out on the motorcycle and say ride on a relatively deserted straight road and take me at whatever speed I ask? So, you know, if that's 10 miles an hour, great. Uh, if that gets you a little less afraid of riding, try that. Uh, slowly increase the speed. See if it's something that you could enjoy just because you get to be with your partner. Now, I'm not telling you you have to do this. I mean, if you've got some wild, crazy, insane phobia about it, don't. Um, but it's a thought. If there's something he does, mm, you could possibly work your way into it slowly. <clears throat> but that's one subject. That's doing it with him. And the other is uh, listening to him when he gets back. Clearly, uh, for whatever reasons, whether it was out of resentment, simply lack of interest in motorcycle riding, whatever, you didn't want to hear the details of the trip. But, you know, that's not the point. It's not the motorcycle. It's not the trip. It's not where he went. It's not who he was with. It's all about him. Uh, people talk to me all the time, friends, kids, my wife, many people, about subjects in which I would have zero interest if they didn't involve those people who are talking to me. Uh, gosh, people talk to me about movies and video games and shopping and trips to the manicurist and their conversation with their aunt Rhoda. Uh, and you know, I would have zero interest in many of those subjects. But when someone is speaking, they're, they're sharing with you their soul. They're sharing with you what really matters to them. They're sharing themselves with you. That's the subject. So when your husband talks about riding a bike, you tend to hear motorcycle, roads, snow. He's telling you about his pleasure as he did those things. If you can reframe that in your head and understand that he's talking about himself, it might help you change the way that you listen to him. It's all about him. Almost every time anybody speaks, they're telling you about themselves. It doesn't matter what words they're using. They want to be heard. So when you get that, you can really think as you're listening. So as he's talking about you know, going through a certain mountain pass, and you can say, whoa, I mean, that, that must have just been glorious to be out on this road and seeing everything all around you, the mountains above you, the clouds, the, the road, the canyon on your left or right or whichever side it was, 
And being on a bike, to be able to see all that simultaneously, which you really can't do in a car. In a car, you'd look out this little itty-bitty window and you get this little tiny snapshot of what you're looking at, but you can't, you know, be sticking your head out the window and looking all around while you're driving. It must just be spectacular for you. The moment you do that, he gets that you're asking about his experience. You're asking about him, his feelings. That's that's really fun for anybody to be listened to like that. And you know, most of us don't know how to listen like that. Uh, we listen to somebody for you know a, a, a polite 30 seconds, and then we formulate what we want to say next. And as soon as they take a breath, poof, we pop in with what we wanted to say. Uh, all I'm suggesting is that you give it a thought uh, about how you could listen better. And then if you feel like doing it, um, you know, even while he's talking, you could demonstrate concern with your facial expression, posture, touching him as he talks. Um, and if you want to really start to change things, you might go to him and say, you know, when you told me about your trip, mm, I was thoughtless. So would you mind telling me about more, telling me more about the trip? And this time I'd like to really listen to you. Um, if he believes you and you're sincere, mm, he probably will. So like, you know, even the things that scare you. I mean, I realize that you don't approve of him driving on dangerous roads, but you don't get to control him. Uh, when he talks about driving on snow, he's trying to tell you how exciting that was uh, to be at the edge of danger. And so you can ask questions like, well, riding on snow, I mean, instead of going, isn't that stupid, which I'm sure is the thought that's occurring to you, you can say things like, well, wow, how do you stay up? I mean, on two, it's hard enough on four wheels on snow. How do you keep your balance on two wheels? That must really take skill. Uh, oh, oh, he's just going to beam as he knows you're really listening to him. Here's a reader who says, <coughs> My husband and I have had problems for most of our seven-year marriage, and now we've been separated for a year and a half of the seven years. We have a six-year-old son. I wanted to make our relationship work, but my husband asked me to leave. Three times in the last year and a half, he came uh, to me wanting to uh, try again. But each time, after one or two weeks, he would again tell me to go find someone else more compatible with me. We've been to couples therapy with three to four different therapists. Uh, we've been to a couple of uh, couples retreats, and nothing's worked. When our son was born, my husband no longer wanted to be intimate with me physically, despite my attempts to be intimate with him. In January 2009, uh, he committed to going out on a date with just me um, once a week. I told him he didn't have to stop doing his other social outings or even his dating of others because I didn't want to put restrictions on what he could or could not do. So just a you know, brief note, what I'm hearing so far is, you know, your relationship has been pretty awful for almost the whole time. And if he's going out with other women, he's pretty much given, out, given up. Um, so simply trying again is very unlikely to work. After you've been through multiple therapists and weekends and all of that, and you've gotten to a place where he's pretty much quit, even though he comes back periodically and says, let's try it again. Simply using the old tools that have created a terrible relationship and using them harder, trying harder, I don't know I've ever seen it work. So that's the first thing. Uh, and marriage therapy often fails because it's about using techniques and tricks and tools that are temporary. So it can all be pretty discouraging, I get that, uh, and painful and uh, frustrating. So we'll get to a solution here in a second. I'm just trying to give you the idea that I'm getting how kind of hopeless feeling this would be and how painful for you. Then you say, but he never even asked me out. So he committed to you know once a week with you and then didn't ever do anything. I asked him out. And on the two occasions that we did go out, we ate together and he just sat with his arms crossed across the table from me and was really distant. I asked him out other times, but he turned me down. 
So I told him that I wasn't feeling good about us, uh, as I felt that he wasn't committing to trying, as he said he would. He told me to file for divorce because he wasn't willing to commit uh, 100% to, to trying, which of course is what real trying is. When most people say they're willing to try again, they really mean, mm, I'll give it 20%. Uh, well, 20% isn't going to do it. You know, it's like jumping 20% of the way across a canyon. It doesn't matter how many times you do it. He said he'd been 100% committed before, which is, of course, very unlikely, and he felt bad that I didn't feel this from him or recognize his attempts to show me that he cared. So what you're describing so far is very common. Uh, people get married. Things are very exciting and fulfilling in the beginning, of course, because there's this gush of imitation love from both parties and they just love the feeling but then it always wears off and then you have what you guys have disappointment bitterness blaming victimhood you know you're not grateful enough for what I do even though you know what I do is you know 20 percent of a real effort um, and this goes on and on until one or both people in the relationships comes to some understanding of what's really needed which is obviously uh, an element of unconditional love. You continue, while we were still living together, he was diagnosed with hypomanic bipolar disorder, but he was very upset about the label, denied the diagnosis, and refused any treatment for it. I asked him if he wanted to get another opinion, and he refused. Uh, now he admits to having been clinically depressed, uh, because during you know one period when we were separated, he became an alcoholic, made some really bad business decisions, uh, had no income for three years, oh, excuse me, I guess this wasn't just when you were separated, but during your marriage, uh, lost a lot of money and had an affair. Um, it's helpful for you to understand uh, and to actually do some research into uh, bipolar disorder to know that uh, this disorder doesn't just make you feel bad uh, or depressed, it actually alters your thinking. People who are affected by this, is, this disorder do not think rationally. They don't think sensibly. Um, and, you know, depending on how bad it is, sometimes it becomes just utterly impossible while you're in the throes of this problem to either feel or give real love. It, people become just too nuts. It, the thinking is just, the thinking and the feeling are just too distorted uh, to accurately perceive unconditional love. Uh, so, you know, I'd have to meet him to know where he was in all this, and, you know, he's had somebody else make that diagnosis. Uh, sometimes, real love, if bipolar disorder isn't bad enough, sufficient real love will actually eliminate the condition. Many mental illnesses are caused by a lack of sufficient real love. If it's the most important thing that a child can have, and the child doesn't get it from birth on, uh, the effect isn't just mild. Uh, the, de the effect is it's just catastrophic. You know, it can cause uh, d depression, bipolar. It goes on and on what, can what it can cause. In the same way that stress causes a vast array of physical disorders, uh, anywhere from ulcers to cancer. So just as reasonable that the lack of the thing that we need most of all would lead to emotional disorders and then not a big step to believe that it would cause mental illness, like not a big step at all. So some people who've been depressed and been affected by bipolar uh, disorder can actually be healed by sufficient real love. Uh, sometimes, uh, however, medication is required before uh, people with bipolar can feel or feel anything good or think clearly. So sometimes you have to do medication, and sometimes it takes a sufficient amount of real love to get people to the place where they will then even take the medication. So then they take the medication, and then sometimes with even more real love, they can get off the medication. So the, there's a real mix of you know, need for medication, you know, biochemical change, the relationship to how you've been loved all your life, and they all uh, play a part. I usually recommend to people that they try real love first, you know, unless they're suicidal, in which case I recommend medication first. Um, and then if real love is has no effect over a matter of, it depends on how unhappy people are, a month, two months, it varies, then medication may be the next step. 
uh, and then you keep doing the real love and see if eventually people can get off their medication. So it's, it's quite an interplay of causes and treatments, uh, but they're, they're all important. You said he, can, he took a vacation alone uh, to think and read several health book, help, read several self-help books. Say that really fast. Read several self-help books. And he said he wants to try again with me. Uh, but this was after he told me to file for divorce. So in the meantime, you know, before he said he wanted to try again, uh, I had met somebody else and fallen in love, you say. I'd been dating on and off for the last year and a half since we've been separated. So this was not my first experience with a new relationship since the separation. I'm feeling really good about my new relationship, which has been going on now for five months. I feel love for my boyfriend and his acceptance of me. Now, all very understandable. I mean, your marriage has collapsed. You would want to fill that gap, uh, you know, with companionship from somebody else. But is the instant you separated from your husband, you started dating. As you st as you stayed here, you know, if you if you've been in a horrible relationship and failing at it for a long time, there's and been miserable. There's no way you could have a concept of what an unconditionally loving relationship would be impossible, which is why I suggest to people that they not even think about dating until they've been in no relationship, zero, divorced, no dating, nothing, for at least a year. And I don't just mean a passage of time, you know, wait a year, let's try to get, no, because you're going to be the same person. I mean, wait a year, really making the finding and giving of real love the center focus of your life. Then you consider dating. So here you are in a miserable relationship. You separated and you started dating right off. No way you're going to be able to separate yourself from the effects of imitation love. You would fall right back in the same hole again and again. Uh, so the odds that you're experiencing uh, unconditional love from your boyfriend are pretty tiny. In the first place, you haven't known what it was and you've been together for five months. I mean, you're still in the honeymoon of imitation love exchange. You continue, I don't know uh, whether to try again with my ex or to get divorced and go with my boyfriend. You have no idea whether your boyfriend loves you. You're, you're still just exchanging imitation love like crazy. Uh, and you remember, you said you're certain that he loves you. Well, you thought that about your husband when you married him, remember? That's what you thought or you wouldn't have married him and looked how, look how that turned out. Uh, and you're already kind of half out the door. Um, you've been dating for a year and a half and you're already calling him your ex. So, A, you haven't learned how to be unconditionally loving in any relationship. B, you're swimming in imitation love. So the odds that you would know a loving relationship are zero. I'd say close to zero, but mm, it's zero. I've never met anybody in the circumstances that you describe that would know real love from imitation. You continue. Uh, I want to do no criticism of you, by the way, just a sharing of observation of thousands of people as they've gone through processes like this. Uh, I want to do the best thing for my son, and I feel a sense of obligation toward my separated husband to stand by him uh, as he went through his mental breakdown. Didn't know about that. That's first news of that. And is now ready to try again. My ex says that he sees me as a friend, uh, that is, your present husband and does not have intimate feelings for me, but his hope would be that they would develop with time as he feels accepted and loved. So your, your marriage was pretty much doomed from the beginning, but to give up now before you applied the one thing that works, which is real love, would be, well, sad, premature. Um, you know, if your car pulls over to the side of the road and it doesn't start, um, it'd be a little premature to have it carted off to the junkyard before you actually like put gas in it. Uh, you know, the one thing that runs the car. Same with marriages. I mean, they keep, people say, well, but I've been trying so long. Well, that's like saying you've been standing by the side of your car on the side of the road for so long without putting gas in it. Who cares how long you've been doing something that's ineffective? What matters is how long and how thoroughly committed you are, how fully involved you are in implementing the only thing that works. Uh, 
So until you've really tried that, mm, giving up would be kind of fast. Uh, you know, you've committed to stay together, you have a son together. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to really try. You, you know, you expressed some concern about the lack of intimacy. Oh, please. So far, I've never seen a couple who, after implementing real love and genuinely caring about each other, who were filled with unconditional love and happiness, who said, we're just sexually incompatible. The odds of that are almost zero. Uh, I've never seen one. There may be one out there somewhere. But uh, y you discover that as you care for each other unconditionally, your other passions become, well, inflamed. You become excited about each other, physically, emotionally, in every imaginable way. So I would suggest giving real love a genuine effort. I would suggest, and I don't suggest this for everybody, but in this case, you know, as seriously uh, dysfunctional as your relationship has become, uh, reading a book together probably won't be enough. Um, you could try that. You could say, well, let's read this book together and see what happens. But you've got enough old, pa old patterns of behavior laid down that it's very likely that you'll need some kind of uh, coaching. And almost certainly, from my experience, coaching in person rather than just over the phone, especially as you make the initial change in inertia. The two of you need to feel the influence of somebody unconditionally loving you as they describe, as this person, this coach, describes to you your behaviors and how you might change them. That's much harder to convey over a phone. So I would suggest you actually get a real love coach and spend some time with that uh, person and you can find those on the website. The next viewer says, uh, on many occasions, <coughs> when I've talked with a woman about the need for unconditional love in a happy relationship, she thinks that I'm just setting her up so that if I make some horrible mistake in the future, like being unfaithful or whatever, then she has to unconditionally forgive me. <laughs> I've heard this several times. In other words, the worst case scenario pops into women's heads so that they tend to wonder if unconditional love is what they want to be a part of, since it's difficult for them to think about forgiving the worst case of betrayal or really hurting the other. How do you open up their mind to see the bigger picture of overlooking the small and larger problems that come into our lives and loving each other despite these things or the mistakes that we both may make? I've tried to address this issue, but sometimes with not such great success. We've all been hurt. Almost all of us have been hurt a lot. Anytime somebody fails to love us unconditionally, especially when they express it you know, with energy, um, that's painful. And in most cases, how have we learned to deal with somebody hurting us? Well, with anger, resentment, withdrawal, with you know, all the protecting behaviors, because those then give us some sense of relief. If you hurt me and I attack you back with anger, then I feel less helpless, feel a little bit more powerful. And we're so used to protecting ourselves in those ways that most of us simply cannot imagine giving that up. So we are just as addicted to our protecting behaviors as any drug addict is or alcoholic is to his or her substance. So when you talk about real love, um, people who have any insight tend to hear that they would have to give up their treasured possessions, their defenses, their weapons. And well, that just scares the trash out of people. Uh, they've been using these weapons, these defenses, all their lives. And now you're saying, well, you'd have to just give those up. Now, in the first place, I would say to somebody like that, um, you don't have to do anything. You want to stay angry the rest of your life? Stay angry. You want to be resentful and mad when people hurt you? Please continue. Uh, but the question I would ask is, um, has it ever worked? In all the years that you have uh, 
you know, refused to forgive people and been angry at them and withdrawn from them, has it ever made you truly happy? Has it ever increased the intimacy in your relationships, even one time? No, never. Now, does it make them feel good temporarily? Yeah, I got that, but so does cocaine. And pretty much everybody knows that isn't good for you. Uh, so the fact that it makes you feel good for a minute doesn't qualify as making a thing good. So has it ever worked for you? Nah, not in making you genu genuinely happy. And then ask, them, then ask this, if you're talking to a woman, you might ask her. So why do people do hurtful things to you? Really, only a couple of choices here. Let's see, it's either because they're Satan, um, they're evil, mm, some people actually believe that, uh, or uh, it's because they're not feeling loved and whatever hurtful behavior they exhibited was just one of the things they did to survive. It was a sign of their own emptiness. So if people hurt you because they're empty and then you get angry at them, which says, mm, I don't love you, what do you think the effect's going to be on that person? It's going to make all of their unproductive behaviors worse. So how stupid is that? So you can stay mad at people if you want to. You can say, I'm not going to forgive them. Great. And um, it's not only not going to work, it's going to make things worse. Um, and then I would further say to her, you're not really being asked to, you're certainly not being told to do anything, but you're not even being asked to give up something. Not really. Um, you're being asked if you want to gain something. It's not about, I don't think about giving up anger. It's about being loving. It's about, instead of being miserable and angry, would I rather be loving and happy? Well, yeah, come to think of it, I think I would. Well, then why not? Now, I could hang on to the temporary pleasure of being mad at you and watching you squirm, but why? When I could do something far more productive, both for you and for me. When I'm loving, I never lose. Ever lose. If I'm loving, I'm always happier. Now, if I'm loving, it's not always true that the other person responds in a loving or accepting way. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter. I'm always happier. Whereas if I'm angry, uh, nobody ever wins. It's always a lose-lose. It's, you know, kind of easy. And the big thing that, you know, these women are telling you is that it's the doormat thing. They're afraid they'll be used. They're afraid that if they're told, well, you have to forgive, there's no have to, it's just an opportunity to forgive and be happy. But you're not stuck. That's what they're, they're afraid that they'll be trapped. Uh, and that, you know, you can then make all the mistakes you want to and they'll be stuck. No. Um, if you and I are in a relationship, for example, and you are hateful and snotty, and I respond in a loving way, well, A, I'll be happy, and it's very likely that your hate and snottiness will decrease. But let's say that you continue to be hateful and snotty and rude and emotionally abusive, or maybe even hit me uh, physically. I still have a choice. The first time, I would just talk to you about it. I would try loving you. Maybe the second time, maybe the third time. But, you know, after a while, if I decide, mm, this, this isn't all that fun. Um, I don't know that I want to be railed at anymore. I'm not sure I want to be hit the next time. Well, then I can still lovingly and completely forgiving you still say, mm, I choose not to participate in this. So that when you call me up and start screaming at me, I can say, well, hey, it's been nice talking to you, I've, uh, but uh, I have to go. I don't even have to say it's been nice talking to you. Just, uh, I have to go now. Uh, if I'm in a marriage where I'm being physically, emotionally abused and I do my very best to be loving, and I don't mean for a week, I mean really try for a prolonged period of time and my partner absolutely won't participate, I may choose to leave that relationship. It's my choice. You're never stuck. But you got nothing to lose by being loving in the meantime. So that's what people are worried about when they talk about the downside of being loving. Uh, it's fear of giving up what they're used to, uh, fear of being stuck, and simply not understanding how real love works and how wonderful it can be. <coughs> this viewer says, uh, 
I'm currently in a long distance relationship. Uh, I visited with my boyfriend in Chicago during the summer months and returned home to California. He threw a surprise birthday party that was so awesome. His card was cute and he signed it, I love you very much, and signed it with his initials. Uh, then he called me at home to be sure that I got home okay, and from that point on, I began to be lonesome for him and started some crap. I don't quite know what crap means. I assume some unproductive things, perhaps, that you said to him. Uh, then you said, I know I was wrong, and now I want to make it better. I really need to talk with somebody that has professional advice, or I will lose my mind. Uh, I lost my husband of 33 years of marriage and was very much in love with him. I dated several men and then fell in love with this guy. Um, you know, the, the birthday party and the cute words on a card uh, are entertaining, fun, exciting, uh, flattering, but by themselves don't necessarily mean very much. And if, you know, when you got home uh, and the attention was gone, you immediately became lonely and, as you said, started some crap, mm, you know, I would question two things. You know, one, do, do you even know what it means to feel uh, real love? Because, you know, if, if what your partner was offering you was real, and as soon as you got home and it wasn't there, you, like you said, you were afraid you'll lose your mind, um, either you're not ready for an unconditionally loving relationship at this point, uh, or the two of you are not sharing uh, unconditional love. In other words, you're not ready for any relationship or it may not be the right one with this particular person. Uh, but the relationship or you or both are not as yet stable in an understanding and feeling for uh, real love. So, you know, I would suggest that you read Real Love and Dating to look for because, you know, you mentioned cool birthday card and that kind of thing, but you didn't really talk about the two of you sharing the truth with each other at all. So it kind of makes me wonder what your relationship is based on. So I would read Real Love and Dating that gives you pages of questions that you can ask your uh, potential partner uh, in considering whether to move on with this relationship. And then also read Real Love and Marriage to see if you're ready for that kind of uh, relationship. So read, I would say reading, uh, participating in conference calls, sharing the, uh, and you can go to reallove.com and find a long list of conference calls, and share what you're experiencing with people who are more experienced in real love so that they can give you some input. Uh, and then eventually, if that's not enough, uh, you can always get a coach who can coach you for a month or two as you're in this relationship to help you determine uh, whether it is the right relationship or whether you're even ready for one. Uh, so I would suggest all those things and see how it goes. Write me again in another month or two. <coughs> this person says, uh, this viewer, when do you know uh, if it's time to throw in the towel? With regard to marriage, Let's see. Oh, her. When do you know if it's time to throw? Oh, to throw in the towel with regard to marriage. I'm at a point where I am truly sunburned, as is my husband, I'm sure, and I'm just at my absolute worst whenever I'm with him. Even if I've been loved by others immediately before being with him, and even when I'm being loving, there are clearly some expectations there. I'm sure. It doesn't help that I'm physically empty. Uh, in the last five weeks of pregnancy or that my two-year-old is driving me insane and I can't keep up with him. I'm just feeling so done, I don't know what to do. I'm terrified of how things will pan out once the new baby gets here uh, and then I'll be stuck with care for two children, an emotionally retarded husband who is irresponsible, angry, sometimes violent, sometimes emotionally abusive, and a uh, persistent porn addict and I'll have all the housework to do on top of everything else. I'm feeling stuck. I get asked this question a lot uh, because it's one of the most difficult decisions there is. Uh, you're with somebody who is clearly not moving toward unconditional love. You've been with them for a while. You have many reasons to stay with them. Um, children, marriage commitment, so on. Um, 
And so those are all reasons why you'd want to stay. And, but then on the other hand, you know, what's the effect of the constant distraction, the constant weight uh, on your shoulders of somebody who isn't willing to participate in the kind of relationship that you'd like to have? How do you make a decision like that? So you have to think, you know, what's the effect on you? Is your partner making things so difficult? Because understand that if you were perfectly loving, you could probably take this kind of behavior and respond to it in a way where you could tolerate it for possibly a very long time, maybe a lifetime. Could be that if you were perfectly loving, A, you would respond better to him, and B, he would respond more to your love. Hard to know because there are some people who don't even respond to perfect loving. I'm just saying that if you were perfectly loving, it might be different, but we're not. None of us are perfectly loving. We have to live in the real world and understand our real limitations. It's kind of like saying if I were perfectly strong, I could lift up this house. Um, well, but I'm not, and so attempting to do so could injure me, cripple me, possibly kill me. So we have to make wise decisions about the weights, the burdens that we choose to lift. We can't do the impossible. So on the one hand, you have your commitments and the reasons to stay with him, but on the other, you know, what's the effect on you? Is, is his distraction, because you also have to tell the truth about his behavior. When people are un sufficiently unloving to us, when we are imperfect in our ability to feel loved and our ability to be loving, it has an effect on us. When we're imperfect, it will. And so if the effect of his unloving behaviors, and you described quite a few of them, uh, is serious enough, it can actually get to the place where these behaviors on his part can make it almost impossible for you to grow, even when you're doing your very best. Uh, you take a young, tender plant just coming out of the ground and you kick it with your boot, uh, you'll break it off and kill it. Whereas if you try that when the plant has grown into a hundred-year-old tree, um, you'll break your foot. So we have to be realistic about where we are and what we're capable of doing. And if you're still a tender shoot trying to grow and you're breaking yourself against this weight, then sometimes it's smarter to leave the weight and to make it possible for you to continue to grow. The same thing is true with your son. Uh, if this abusive behavior and the contention between the two of you is having a sufficiently destructive uh, effect on your son, that's another thing to throw into the mix. So you have to think about all these things. And if there are sufficient negative effects, then you know leaving a relationship becomes a consideration. I can't tell you whether it's time for you to leave. I can just tell you the things to think about as you consider doing so. Uh, on very rare occasions have I ever said to somebody, get out. But I have. Uh, because in some cases, people are just being crushed by a relationship. There's no way that they could learn to be to feel loved and to be loving while in a relationship like that. This next viewer says, I've wanted to find a partner and friends who get me. Uh, I've heard other people on calls, uh, even coaches, express that desire. Is having someone get me just a variation on believing that someone's love is special? Do you think how much someone gets us is more about how well we're telling the truth about ourselves and whether they can be wise? If so, then it would follow that I could have lots of people in my life who really get me and how cool would that be? Um, so it's very important that somebody get you. Uh, that's the whole essence of telling the truth about yourself and then feeling seen for who you really are, and then feeling accepted and loved. So being gotten, uh, as you put it, is pretty important. It doesn't mean very much if somebody says, I love you, when they don't understand you at all. And the more they understand you, the more you feel seen and accepted. So it becomes increasingly powerful when people love you, 
the more they know. Hence, the importance of our telling the truth about ourselves and being seen for who we really are. Whereas if, for example, in dating, you simply posture and put your best foot forward and pretend to be all marvelous to try to get people to love you, and then they like you, you can't really feel like they get you a bit. All you can feel like is that they enjoy the show that you've been putting on, which is quite different. So, yeah, it's partly a function of your ability to tell the truth. It's partly a function of the other person to be capable of unconditionally loving. Where it becomes uh, distracting is when you need somebody to demonstrate how they get you in a particular way. Uh, that they have to show it with smiles and praise or sex or money or whatever. Well, see, then... That's not really evidence that they get you. That's evidence of you just manipulating them. And it also becomes uh, unproductive when we insist that any particular person get us. For example, um, as a guy, if I'm single, and I insist that, that somebody can get me only if they are flattered by me, think that I'm handsome, um, and want to be my exclusive partner and go to bed with me. Mm, that's not getting me. Um, that's just supplying me. So it does become distracting when we have to feel like we're the, and you mentioned it, the, you know, gotten in a certain way, uh, given certain things, or treated special. This is a huge roadblock that many people have. Not only do they have to be, do they have to feel accepted, but they have to be feel accepted and put ahead of everybody else. Now, sure, once you actually are in a committed relationship with somebody, once you're married to somebody. Mm, we sh you should put your partner ahead of everybody else. But until then, uh, relax uh, and see what it's like just to be seen, accepted, and loved by pretty much anybody. When you can do that consistently, then you might be ready for dating and looking for an exclusive partner. Uh, but if you don't know what unconditional love is and what it's like to just be seen, accepted, and loved, you're going to go into dating with these enormous expectations and you'll choke any potential partner to death. Here's um, somebody who says, uh, can you talk about being responsible and being willing to change? <coughs> there are several people that call into the conference calls with ongoing behaviors that are addictive in nature. <clears throat> How can these people be best facilitated week after week? Is it responsible for the facilitators to suggest recovery beyond real love? I don't know that there's such a thing as a recovery beyond real love. I mean, if, if you feel sufficiently unconditionally loved and loving, your addictions will fade away. Um, it may be, maybe you're suggesting, is it responsible for a facilitator to suggest that in addition to real love meetings, they might attend Alcoholics Anonymous, for example? Sure. Uh, if, if I'm a good facilitator on a conference call and somebody describes an addictive behavior over and over and over and it's the same thing week after week, well, you know, that doesn't make them bad, it doesn't make them anything except unhappy. Uh, the idea is that then as a facilitator, it would be my goal, my responsibility even, to suggest to that person anything that would work. So let's say that somebody calls in and they're an alcoholic. Um, I would start off with just letting them talk about that and unconditionally accepting them. If after doing that for oh a number of weeks and they're still using just like they've used before, well now I'm going to go beyond just accepting them on a conference call. Now I'm going to suggest that they actually start committing to something. And it would be foolish to just let them go on and on with their description of their addictive behavior over and over again. So behavior changes as we make a commitment to see things differently and behave differently. So I would then suggest that person that, for example, an alcoholic, it might help them to go to AA meetings, for example, uh, to go to a meeting every day for mm, at least 90 days because it puts them in a different pattern where every day they have to account for their behavior to other people. To people who won't put up with deception regarding at least 
that particular addiction. Now, if you go to AA, they'll talk about your um, alcoholism or your drug addiction. They probably won't talk so much about you know the fact that you're a victim and a liar and everything else. But at least you're dealing with that one. I would suggest that they get a sponsor with whom they speak on a regular basis, preferably every day or two, and actually work through the 12 steps, which can be remarkably effective. Uh, if that's not enough, then I would suggest that they not only participate in conference calls, but that they call specific people that they've gotten to know on the conference calls and account for their behavior and create opportunities to feel unconditionally loved in addition to just kind of an open call where you know there are a whole lot of people uh, competing for attention. I don't mean competing in a negative way. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's responsible for a facilitator to suggest as many things as possible. Then if a person uh, continues and you know they have symptoms of depression, for example, um, I might suggest that they see their family physician or psychiatrist. Uh, well, the, the modalities, the, the, the potential therapeutic uh, regimens go on and on. Uh, so sure, there's a whole lot more to do than just a conference call and, and taking that outside the bounds of just you know simply the standard real love approaches is not only acceptable but desired. I mean, just the other day I told a man <coughs> as we were talking about his relationship that that the more I learned about him, uh, because I'd only really been hearing about him intently over the last oh couple of weeks or so. And the more I heard about him, the more I thought that in addition to everything else, all the other issues that everybody else has, he was depressed. And the ought to go see his physician uh, immediately uh, about some form of uh, therapeutic trial to see if it made a difference. Uh, you do whatever works. Here's somebody who says, uh, I don't desire a relationship at all. I mean, a romantic relationship. I feel good. I feel loved uh, without a partner. Uh, is that involved with real love somehow? I think so involved. I guess you mean, is that real? Oh, is that because of real love somehow? Perhaps that's what you mean. If I get that wrong, let me know here as I'm speaking. Um, the more <coughs> unconditionally loved we feel, the less we require love from any particular person. So it's been my experience that the more that a single person feels unconditionally loved, the less urgency they feel about ever having a partner. When somebody is single and says, I've just, I just got to have me a man, or a guy says, I've, I just got to have me a woman, I'm thinking, oh man, please let me know if you're going to date because you know, I'm going to put a notice out on the internet net to avoid you at all costs. Uh, if we have this urge that we have to be with an intimate partner, um, we'll go in and choke that person to death. We'll manipulate them, uh, we'll coerce them, we'll use them, and we'll destroy the relationship. So the time to go into a relationship, the best time is when we don't especially feel like we have to have one. Um, so what you're experiencing here with most of the people that I've known who've described this is entirely healthy. Now a few people, it's, with a few people it's not just a matter of not you know, feeling compelled to have an intimate relationship, they're actually afraid of one, uh, in which case Mm, just talk more about that with people who are more experienced in real love and, and just ask yourself the question. Uh, am I afraid of one? Am I avoiding one because of the horrible past experiences I've had with an intimate exclusive relationship? Or is it just that now I feel peaceful? So it's, it's quite a, if you think, just think in your mind about beginning to date. If thinking about beginning to date gives you a feeling of just like, well, could, could not, Mm, don't really feel an urge to. That's almost certainly healthy. Whereas if you th think about beginning to date and you go, oh man, not that again. I, I don't even want to start down that road again. Then the motivation is usually out of fear and that's usually unhealthy. Which doesn't mean then go date. <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it just means that, your mo that the, the motivation for not doing it is out of emptiness and fear. So you would still want to become experienced in real love before you dated, but now you know more about the motivation. Um, 
but is, I'm tickled to hear this. Uh, if everybody waited today until they felt like you just described, then they wouldn't be like it is for most of us when if you're on a diet uh, and you haven't eaten and you go to the grocery store. Oh, well, what are the odds that if you're starving to death and you're on a diet uh, and you go to the grocery store, you're going to get broccoli? Uh, you know, I mean, that's when you get chocolate cake and donuts. And in relationships, you can certainly find chocolate cake and donuts, but it's not going to satisfy you. Um, here's somebody who says, somebody is close to me. Uh, somebody close to me is in a lot of pain. What is the best way to approach them and encourage them to uh, seek help? Um, if you're capable of doing it, if, if you're not capable, if you're feeling empty and afraid yourself and feeling anxious about talking to them, mm, if you're feeling anxious, you're probably going to make it worse. So you don't do anything. Uh, people who are already drowning don't need another drowning person in the pool with them. They just don't. It doesn't help them. Uh, we end up pulling them further under the water. But if you're in a place where you feel like you can talk to this person calmly, with no agenda, uh, then here would be an opportunity to simply say, um, you know, in watching you over the last blank, two weeks, month, year, lifetime, uh, it seems that you just you're just not very happy uh, if they want that's all you say you don't tell them what they should do if they want to talk to you it will become immediately apparent because they'll answer your question uh, yeah I've, I've been miserable for the blah, blah 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 long time uh, at which point now you can say well, you know I hate feeling unhappy and I hate to see you feel unhappy if you're interested I could describe to you some things that have been helpful to me. And then you could describe to them mm, some of the principles of real love, how they might see their situation in a uh, more accurate and productive way, uh, some people that they might talk to, conference calls that they might attend, books that they might read, whatever. You don't want to dump all that probably on their heads all at one time, but then you can describe some possible behavior. And you say, these are just some possibilities, not you should go do this. So you start with one or two things and say, these have been helpful to me. If you find them helpful to you, great. And if you're willing to continue to talk to me about this, well, I'd be glad to. But at any point, and I often say this to people, at any point that you feel uncomfortable sharing more with me about how you're feeling, or uncomfortable with what I'm saying, mm -hmm. All you have to do is say, I don't want to talk. Uh, either I don't want to talk today, I don't want to talk this minute, um, I don't want to talk to you ever again, just whatever. So that way, see, notice you're expressing a genuine interest in their happiness, but with no pressure. They can take it or not, they can stop it any time they want to, and usually under those conditions, people tend to talk, which is kind of fun. Uh, and you have to decide ahead of time that whether you're capable of offering this and feeling no disappointment if they turn you away or turn you down. In that case, mm, it's very likely that um, you'll be able to offer them something meaningful, worthwhile, productive, uh, and that it won't be a miserable experience. So it's been a wonderful hour. You've all asked outstanding questions uh, as usual and it's really fun hearing people share their lives and knowing that uh, we, you know, for each question that's asked or each observation made there are millions of us who have the same question or would make the same observation or have a similar problem or so very grateful to those of you who would uh, share your lives with us we'll be talking again a week from today uh, I look forward to that and in the meantime remember as always that it's always about real love see you in a week